Matthew chapter 7. We may be finishing the Sermon on the Mount this morning, uh, which is a big deal because this is like part 20. We've been in this for seven years or something. Um, it's a long section, and I've made room for next week if we don't get to it, so you don't have to be worried. But um, uh, we're going to read chapter 7, verses 12 to 29, which is kind of lengthy, but all of these things fit together and don't need a lot of explaining, so don't be nervous. And if you're just now tuning in to Facebook Live, we want to welcome you uh, to the service. And I know our brother Wes, who's here every single week, one of the, he's a super faithful um, tri church member and friend to me, and he is at home w- with uh, severe leg pain and immobile. And so he was texting me this morning, what time does the live stream start? And so Wes, we're praying for you too, brother, and grateful that you can follow along. Let's read the passage, um, and then we'll pray and jump right in. Matthew 7, verses 12 to 29. Uh, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it or enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly or ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And this is where it gets even more sober. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell And great was the fall of it. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. God, we thank you for your word to us that you are not a God who hides. You are not a God who is silent. You have put yourself on display in creation. You have made us in your image and crafted us to have a longing for something deeper and something more. We have an innate understanding that you are there and real, but you have not left us to figure that out. You have spoken into our world clearly through prophets and by the scriptures and ultimately by sending your son Jesus and through the recorded teachings of him that we have this morning. God, we're hungry to really have a a bold interaction with you, not just these words, but to understand what they mean and so so connect with the reality of who you are. God, I thank you for the sober warnings that exist in this section of scripture, and I pray that we would get it, and it would alter the way that we think and feel and speak and act, and ultimately, Uh, change the way we live our lives to make us the people that you've called us to be and ultimately to be welcomed home after our own death. We just commit this time to you. I don't know what it is about the rain, God. It just makes us a little drowsy and a little quiet. And I just pray that uh, we would have everything from you that you have in store for us. And so we receive it from your hand with gratitude and faith in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... All right, here's a question for you. Who wants to live? That should be a bold and confident yes, right? Um, one of the amazing things about the human spirit is the desire to live. Um, twice in the past 
couple of years, I've had the, the uh, honor and privilege to visit someone in hospice care that was at the end of their life. And one of the things the hospice nurses will tell you is that there's a, a strong will to live, even when physically the body is, is just cannot, cannot handle life. The spirit holds on. And I've seen people holding on, waiting for something valuable and important, usually a family interaction or some kind of, of a moment or peace, and then to see them experience that and then slip beyond the veil is amazing to see. God made us with a, a powerful desire to live. And, and I don't know if you're like me, but I also want to live the life I want to live. <laughs> uh, sometimes, and you go, all of us go through se- seasons like this, we find ourselves living a life that is not the life we want to live. Um, the first quarter of this year, I kept, my wife and I, we just kept having conflict, and it was always about church stuff, and things were difficult, and we spent all our time kind of like working through stuff, and it was tense, and it kind of came from just overworking and trying to do all of this stuff and stay on top of all this stuff, and everything was just getting kind of out of control and tense. Anybody ever had a season like that? And I remember in one of those conversations, we both just came to the conclusion of like, this is not the life we're trying to live. Anybody ever said that? Now, it's not easy to live the life you want to live. What's amazing, though, and outstanding and phenomenal is what we see in this passage is that God wants you to live, really live. He wants you to be alive. He made you. He breathed life into you. He wants you to live the life that's the best for you, and ultimately, he wants you to experience spiritual regeneration so that you can live truly, and he's the one who knows what that is. It's the author of that, and is the gift giver of real life. And while this passage has a lot of warnings and scary sayings in it, the heart behind it is a God who wants you to live. The scriptures say that Jesus said of himself, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that is what the heart of God is behind these sayings. The kind of cohesive reality of this passage is my sermon title, Life is in the living. Can we all say that together? Life is in the living. And Jesus goes through some places that it is not. Um, At the crux of this application in chapter 7 is verse 12. Jesus really cares how you treat other people. It really comes down to, do you know God? Are you living a life that's Godward? And then how does that flow into the way you treat other people? And so this is the crux of his application in verse 12. Here's easy, he says. Whatever you want someone to do to you, do that thing to them. That will create all sorts of generosity and kindness on your part if you are living that way. And it's in that living that life that is a gift from God, but ultimately that's expressed in love for other people, that we experience the life. The life is in the living. The first section tells us that the life isn't in the right group. This can be a tricky passage, and it's easy to get this one wrong. So let's look at it together in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Um, It's easy to kind of look at that and go, does that mean that lots of people don't end up getting saved and end up perishing, and only a few people end up saved, and those people who do have a really terrible life? It's kind of what it can sound like. Um, and sometimes if you've, if you've been trying to follow God in a certain way, and especially with certain people, you can feel like, this is hard. Um, this is hard. But um, the emphasis in this passage is on Jesus' command to enter. Do you see that, where it starts? Enter life. This is the heart. And what he's saying here is not that being a Christian or being saved or finding life is hard and hardly anybody finds it. What he's talking about here, and if you have the King James Version, it'll say the gate is straight and the way is narrow, and then you're like, narrow and hard, how do those things come together? We even say the straight and narrow, that's like a little pun we throw out there from the King James from this passage, Uh, the straight and narrow, this is kind of me living my life the way I'm supposed to, but really that's not what this passage means at all. Um, Jesus is is, uh, kind of contrasting two ways, two gates, two pathways. Um, It it reminded me of uh, pre-9-11 air travel. Anybody fly before 2001? Do you remember how you used to just go to the airport and get on a plane and then fly? And that was it. That was the whole thing. And there was all these wide concourses and there was room for everybody. And you got there. Remember you used to greet people when they would come in? You'd go to pick people up at the airport. You'd walk all the way to the gate and they would come off the plane. You'd be like, hey. Right? Now there's nine miles of security between you and that moment. 
What happens now is you show up to the airport and you get a long line of people and you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller all the way down to you go in to security by yourself, stripped of your dignity and possessions, right? <laughs> this is the terminology that Jesus is using. He's saying, listen, the way to destruction is easy to find. It's wide, smooth, and it's everybody's on it. You go with the crowd, you end up in destruction. But he says, I want you to enter life, and the way to enter life is not that way. In fact, this, this would have hit a first century audience a lot different than us. They saw themselves as having life from God, having privilege from God, having a calling from God because of their ethnic heritage. And so they looked around and said, I'm in the right family, so I'm heading the right direction. And Jesus says, actually, no, that's not how it is. This this description is kind of like that security uh, metal detector you walk through or that turnstile that you go through at Disney World. It's about being individual and it's about being intentional. This is not something that you happen across. You don't just find it. You don't stumble into the life that God has. It's individual and it's intentional. This is what life looks like. And so life isn't in the right group. And some people still think that way. You think you go to church or you're kind of a good person or you come from good stock and you do right things and you, you kind of are in the right crowd and you're with the right people and you have the right voices. And as long as you're kind of in the club and the club is good, you are good. And Jesus says, that's not the way into life. God, God comes directly to you. And he wants a decision from you. And he wants you to individually and intentionally make a decision to enter life. And if you are thinking you're fine because you're with the right people and you're heading off a cliff, the most loving thing Jesus can say is, be careful. Which is where he goes next in verse 15. Beware, he says. Somebody say, beware. Beware Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. It's funny this comes on the second half of the chapter that's all about not judging people, and now Jesus says you better ju- start judging people, right? In fact, what we see is the, the climax of the application of Jesus' teaching is that we would love like God indiscriminately and yet not be foolish and silly. Uh, you can love people who are inwardly ravenous wolves, but do not be led by them. Do not believe the things they say. You. And so he says, look at the fruit of their life. You don't get bad fruit from good trees. You don't get good fruit from bad trees. And so if someone stands and claims to be a representative of God who's going to tell you prophetic insights, it's a good thing for you to look at their life and say, is this the kind of life that I want to live? Is this the kind of thing that I can affirm? Is this what I'm aiming at? And if the answer is no, then beware of false prophets. And the reason this is so important is because we can also think that life is in the right words. And what Jesus says that's so sober in the middle of the section is that life is not simply in the right words. Verse 21, Jesus says one of the scariest things Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, or acknowledges that Jesus is Lord, calls him personally Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father. Now, granted, words matter. Can somebody say words matter? Words matter a lot. There's power in our words. We have power to tear ourselves down by the things we say about ourselves. We have the power to tear other people down by the things we say about them that are hurtful or wrong. We have the power to build up through encouragement. We have the power to console and comfort. Words have power. And in fact, words have power for salvation as well. You guys are well familiar likely with Romans 10, 9 to 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does it require to be saved? Words. Confession. For with the heart one believes and is justified mysteriously, miraculously, by the power of God, a gift of salvation alone, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now the emphasis in this passage is everyone. Verse 11 says, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him for Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, this is amazing, which means no one is left out. 
And so if you use your words to call on the name of the Lord, believing in your heart he is who he says he is, the response of God is to declare you righteous as a gift of his great mercy. Isn't that amazing? And God uses your words to do that. But he doesn't use only your words to do that. In the church world, when someone claims to be a Christian and does not live in any way like a Christian, but they pray to prayer and that's their confidence, we call that fire insurance, right? You're like, you're, you're a Christian, really? You're a disciple of Jesus? Yeah, oh yeah, I prayed a prayer when I was 11. I walked an aisle, I knelt, repeated after me, and I am going to heaven when I die. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. So Jesus says, beware, because life isn't in the right words. You don't want to find out on that day that you thought wrong and overly relied on a few simple things you said. Jesus continues this stark and scary line of reasoning in verse 22, pointing out us to the fact that life is not only not in the right group or in the right words, but life isn't even in the right activities. He says, on that day, judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Now that can get scarier because you said he was Lord and you actually even participated on apparently supernatural activities that you think Maybe the things that clues you into the fact that you have the life that he's calling you to enter into. This is a terrifying idea to be standing before Jesus with your life behind you, no more time, and you are arguing the point of your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Not where you want to be, right? Now, it's, it's funny. In the scriptures, there's several instances where people who were not genuine disciples of Jesus invoked the name of Jesus and had power over demons and disease. Do you know this? It's not Matthew's gospel, but, and it doesn't always work. There's actually this really funny story in Acts 19. So this is, in Acts, is after Jesus has died on the cross, been raised to new life on the third day, revealed himself to many, uh, commissioned to the church, and then ascended into heaven publicly before all of his disciples. And then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit falls on those disciples, and they are empowered, and they start to do all the works that Jesus did. Phenomenal stuff. And there's an awesome story about some guys who try to get in on the action who aren't genuine followers of Jesus. It's Acts 19. I'll read it for you. It says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or animals that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Notice that he didn't charge for those handkerchiefs. <laughs> then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, so this, these are non-Christians, still Jews, do not acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, this is funny, listen to what they say, I adjure you, speaking to the demons, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. <laughs> Isn't that funny? They're like, let's see if this works. You know how you know you don't know Jesus when you call him the Jesus, <laughs> right? Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Eva were doing this. So this high priest has seven sons. That's a lot of pressure. The high priest is kind of like the top dog in the Jewish culture. And to have seven sons, you're trying to like establish yourself as the standout son. That's a lot of pressure to be kind of the pastor's kid in this environment. Seven of you, and you're trying to stand out, and you're trying to do good. And so they are trying to exercise these demons, and they, they, they adjure them by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. This is so funny. In verse 15, it says... But the evil spirit answered them. Listen to what he says. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? That would be a scary day for those guys. Have a demon talking to you, saying, I don't know you, boy. And then the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them, mastering all of them. That's a tricky little verb we can't talk about. And overpowered them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. There's power in the name of Jesus. Helps to know Jesus. <laughs> you get involved in some warfare that you're not prepared for. Maybe a bad day. When you leave a house running naked and wounded, not a good day. Verse 17 says, And this became known to all the residents at Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them, and the name of Jesus was extolled. 
If there's power uh, in those activities, but those activities alone do not give evidence that you have the life that God wants to give you. So he says, don't think because you're in the right group that you have entered life. Don't think just because you say the right words that you have that real life. Don't think that just because you have participated in what appears to be God-blessed supernatural activity that you have the life. In fact, he says, the life is in the living. He says he will declare to people who claim to have participated in these activities as the justification for why they should enter life. He says, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Note that. It's one thing to have a demon say, I don't know you. It's a terrifying thing to have the living God look in your eyes. You who he loves, who he created, who he is pleading with to enter life, who he is giving the warnings to avoid destruction, look you and say, I never knew you. And he calls them workers of lawlessness, doing what is wrong, specifically and connected to the way we treat other people. He says, just do this. How you want to be treated, treat other people that way. This is the living the life. Do you understand? God doesn't just want to give you life so that you go to heaven when you die or you are part of the new heavens and the new earth when he establishes them. God wants to give you life that changes the way you live now. And if you think you've got something that doesn't change the way you live now, Jesus says, you ain't got it. You don't have it. So how do we get it? Verse 24 Jesus asks the question, what are you building on? What are you building on? Something is the foundation of your life. Something is what gets you out of bed in the morning. Something is what's foundational, the most important to you. Now, all of us are building. If you're breathing and you're living and you're talking and you're doing things, you're building. We're all building. The question is, what are we building on? Verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine, which all of us are hearing, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Sometimes when we think about building on the sand, because we're Floridians or we live in Florida, we think about building on the beach, right? Which is the best thing a human being can do, in my opinion. <laughs> so we might think, oh, that seems foolish, high deductible, hurricane damage possible. This is not Jesus scene. There's a coast, but it's on a little sea and not like our Atlantic Ocean. Uh, when Jesus says those who build their house on the rock and those who build their house on the sand, a uh, first century Israelite would have been thinking about these deltas. Um, the, this would be a place where a dry and arid um, environment, this, not a lot of rain, and, but when the rain does come, it comes hard and fast. It falls onto hard ground and has to flow. So out west, anybody live out west and see flash floods? So these sandy places are where the water would have cut out and, and uh, cut through the rock, and, and the rock would have shaped the way the waters went, and they would be kind of flat, sandy beds. Now, it's easy, wonderful, flat ground if you're going to build something on it, but it's not a place you want to build because <laughs> we know what's going to happen on that sand. The water's going to come. When the rain comes, the flood's going to come, the wind's going to blow, and that thing's coming down. Jesus accesses what would have been common knowledge. Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore, Right? You guys remember the Salty song? Might look kind of nice, but you have to build it twice. Have to build your house once more. Ready? You got to build your house on the rock. Is it, was anybody else born in the 80s? No? Nobody? <laughs> Nobody just not feeling like singing today? So uh, one of the things that's crazy about that song, I was singing it in my mind and out loud. Um, <laughs> you have to build your house once more. It may be really comforting for small children, but Jesus is talking about the house of your life. And he's not talking about the storms of life may come and go, but the peace of God you will know. He's talking about when you've reached the end of your life and you, what you have built is being measured. 
Uh, there's no chance to build your house once more in Jesus' story. He is saying, take care how you build. And how do you build? How do you build on that foundation that will withstand the destruction that is coming to our world? I think it's, it's kind of critical. We don't always understand the way the world really works. Do you know that God made the universe so that he could dwell with a people made in his image? Everything around us, space, our, our solar system, our planet is perfectly constructed for human existence, for life to flourish. And God made that specifically and he placed us here on purpose and he wanted to see the world filled and fruitful and death was not a part of the equation. God wanted a planet where he could be with all people forever. This is where God was going And he made us in his image with the capacity to trust and know and love and have a real relationship with him and with one another. That's part of being in the image of God. I hate to break it to you, but your dog can't do that, right? Dogs are just a little good part of humanity. We go, how sweet, our dog loves me. And cats are the evil part of us, right? (laughs) They're the treacherous part of us. They would like, oh yes, it's true. You cuddle your kitten. Oh, so little. I have a cat. I'm a cat person. I have a cat. I do not have a dog. Nothing against dogs. But my cat hates me. <laughs> she loves me and then she hates me. I watch her come right up to my, my uh, one-year-old son and he's trying to teach him gentle. And you think the, the boy that smacks the cat, right? You think she would go away from that, right? No. She goes right up to it. She lets him hit, him, hit her a few times. She just claws at him. And of course, she's looking at us like, get him away from me, right? <laughs> this little boy is invading my space. She's evil, right? <laughs> She's wonderful and evil. Here's the crazy thing. God didn't make us to be evil, self-centered, treacherous. He made us to be loving and kind and charitable and faithful and good. But he gave us the choice to trust him and obey him and experience the life of God. This is what was symbolized in the Garden of Eden as the, the tree of life, the presence of God, ongoing life. This is amazing stuff. This is what God has for us. But because humanity and each one of us individually have distrusted God and moved away from him and, 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 and darkened ourselves and moved towards self-preservation, we are heading towards destruction and God's breaking into our world, breaking into our individual world, not just the world, everyone, but our lives, our thinking, our hearts and minds. And he's saying, stop, listen, beware. This is going somewhere. And he says, come on in, enter life. Not all y'all, not just by saying the right thing or because you've done a few nice things, a few good things. He says, no, come into the life that I give. The gate is narrow, one at a time, please. And it's hard. It's not hard like difficult. It's actually like, it's a hard word to uh, describe. It means compressed. Anybody, anybody know a hoarder? You ever been in a, in a hoarder house? Yeah, you never, you never get the little lines, the little, little hallways, the house fills up. It's like, it's like cholesterol in there, right? And you just have to kind of find a little row. This is what Jesus is saying. The way is like one at a time. You've got to squeeze sideways to get in there. But he's saying, come in. Don't let somebody else pull you astray. Don't think just because you say the right word about Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. Is he the Lord? The Lord, the Jesus. Ah, I want you to know me, to be the source of life, and then I want you to live it. I want you to build your house on the rock. And this is what Jesus wants you to do. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, The last little verse of this section is verse 28. It says, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd were astonished. That's like the Greek word of saying slack jaw. What is he doing? Now, why is this astonishing? The reason is, if you listen to the tone, if you're used to listening to Jesus, you're like, oh, Jesus is God. We know that, and he's teaching, and no one had ever talked like this, ever. No human being had ever started preaching sermons like that and says, whoever does the words of mine will live. We're like, well, that's pretty bold. Jesus, carpenter from Nazareth, right? He's speaking with authority. He's claiming to know things about the insights from God's perspective, and he is calling everyone to know him. In fact, he's saying, if, you don't, if I don't know you, you don't have life. And he's my father that's in heaven, and I do his will, and the life comes from you doing his will. These are powerful things for Jesus to say, but they're important, because if it is possible for us, 
to join the right crowd, and here you are, and those of you watching online. If it's possible for us to say the right words, maybe pray a prayer, maybe acknowledge a assent to something that God calls us to believe in, if that's possible, and then for us to actually participate in doing things that are supernatural, and yet at the end of all of that, have the Lord of creation look you square in the eyes and say, I did not know you. That is the worst thing that could possibly happen to a person. And so Jesus says, listen, he says, the life is in the living. Go be who I've called you to be. And this is hard to say because two weeks ago I talked about the danger of legalism. And it can sound just like legalism. It can sound like if you do the right things, God will accept you. If you do the right things, if you do all the things Jesus says, then you'll have life. Brothers and sisters, the life isn't from you earning it. The life is a gift, but the life is found in the living. It has to produce something. The real life always produces something powerful, and we cannot, we cannot slack on that. And so the, the bold invitation of Jesus is to enter life. And so I just want to plead with you, if you're listening to my words, and you have not surrendered yourself entirely to the God who made you, you are disconnected from the source of real life. And he is calling your name, saying, come in one at a time, individually and intentionally. It does require your words, but it starts in your heart. He wants to know you. And he says, this is what the source of the life is going to be, knowing Jesus. And he wants that life to find fruition in doing the will of the Father. He's talking about how you treat other people. God cares how you treat other people and that life he's calling you to live, that best life now is in the living. He wants your life to bear fruit. What is on the inside, it comes on the outside. My first pastor used to say, we're all like sponges. Things squeeze us, but what's in there comes out, right? So on that day when the big squeeze happens, what happens to you and what's in there? And so the the call is to build wisely to build on the rock, and that means to listen to what Jesus says and to actually do it. Now, the amazing thing is that is the best thing you can do with your life is obey Jesus. And it sounds very simple, doesn't it? But the the stakes are high. You have everything to lose and everything to gain. Amen?